All right, good morning. Very glad that you are here. A few weeks ago, we started a sermon series uh, called Killing My Giants, and it's about dealing with the problems, the issues, the things we struggle with in our lives, and um, having biblical answers to overcome them. And so we talked about killing our past. We've talked about um, just in general the giants in our lives. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about killing temptation. And so before we get started together, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we get to be, be here with you and with each other. So, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit's power and presence would continue to be among us. Father, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus. Father, that your words are heard and you are seen and I am not. Father, because your words have the remarkable ability to make their way into our hearts and to change us. So, Father, I ask that you would give us ears and hearts and minds to hear from you this morning. And in Jesus' name, we all said Amen. So when we hear the word temptation, some very clear images come to mind. Some of those come from like your way distant past. You know, if you grew up in kind of a, a legalistic church, uh, kind of how I grew up in, it was, it was very much, you know, you drink, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or date girls who do. And so it's very rules oriented. And, you know, the, the less mistakes you made, the more God liked you. And so... Um, when you hear the word temptation, you probably think of, you know, the big 10 commandments and, you know, not breaking those. And if you're tempted, they, they kind of fall into those. But, um, the word tempt is fairly generic. Like, have you ever been t tempted to eat more ice cream than you should? Right. Or you crack open that bag of family size Oreos and you live alone. <laughs> okay. So temptation, <laughs> look, I've just heard stories about other people. This is nothing, you stay in your lane. You all stay in your lane. Um, it would not be Oreos, it would be Nutter Butters anyway. Like, you don't know me. Anyway, <clears throat> so when we talk about being tempted, uh, some of that is, is really serious. And other things, it's, it's still tempting, but it's not kind of the way we, we tend, tend to think about the word temptation. Um, like, you know, one of the worst things that can ever happen on the road is that you're driving behind somebody doing the speed limit. We all know that, right? There's, that is one of the worst things that can ever happen to you. You're driving behind somebody doing the speed limit of all the, uh, the audacity. And so you're driving behind them and you're going, come on, let's go, right? And you're tempted to pass them, right? And so you don't. And then about a mile down the road, uh, a police officer is coming the other way. And if you had passed them, you would have not been doing the speed limit ever. And so the fact that you did not give in to that temptation meant that you probably avoided the ticket. So temptation looks a lot different in various parts of our lives. Obviously, we're talking about temptation today. We're not talking about you know, how many cookies you eat or, you know, what you, you know, how you drive or, but, but there's different levels of temptation and different consequences for the temptations that we struggle with. And so what, I think we start off with a very simple and generic statement, which I think most of you agree with, and that is this, being tempted is not the problem. Giving into the temptation is the problem. That's where we run into trouble. So it's, we're all, we're going to talk about this in depth this morning on some level, but you know, we're all going to be tempted in some way or another. And something that may tempt you does not tempt somebody else. And something that is tempting to somebody else may not be tempting to you. And so your struggle in some ways is very significant and exclusive to you in part. You know, there are people who struggle with alcohol and for them to be tempted to drink is different than for you. And so I personally don't struggle with alcohol. I have a bourbon collection and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't struggle to get, getting drunk has never appealed to me. Now, other people, that is a big deal. And so they just cannot, for them, it's a big temptation to drink to excess. For me, that's not an issue. I'd, I'll sit around, and Caleb and I will sit around and just smell it. And that's weird to most of you, but he'll come to the house, and he'll say, hey, are you home? 
Yeah, he goes, okay, I'm coming over. And my, this is what I know. This is my first question. He will verify this. What are you bringing? Because he's found something really cool and he wants me to taste it. So we will open it up and just smell it for 30 minutes. Now, it's a very unique thing because of how it smells and whatever. Now, Caleb only smells three things when he smells bourbon. He smells toasted marshmallow, he smells caramel, and he smells, what's the other one? No, no, there's another one. Because Caleb doesn't eat fruit. So he's, he, he couldn't tell you what a strawberry smells like because he doesn't eat them. So he doesn't eat apples. He, so there's nothing he's going to smell in a glass of bourbon that is anything probably in it because it all smells like toasted marshmallows to him. So anyway... For, for me, that's not a temptation. I, I wouldn't necessarily struggle with that. But for some people, they should never drink. Because the temptation to drink and more and more and more and more is a big deal for them. And so for some people being tempted, it's very unique to them. And it's not unique in that it's only them because there's other people who have the same struggle. So this morning we're going to talk about temptation in some detailed ways and some generic ways. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 12 to 14. The Apostle Paul says, So if you think you are standing firm, be very careful that you don't fall. So if you get to the point where you think, I'm not tempted by that anymore. He says, be very, very careful. Because then you are most likely to fall back into bad behaviors, sinful behaviors. Now, as we go through all these verses this morning, we're going to be very specific about some things that may hit you right between the eyes. What we, most of us have seen in the story of life is this. The things that tempt you probably fall into one of two categories. We're going to leave this, this verse up. You are tempted to stay where you are. Which if you've made enough mistakes in your life, you know that staying where you are is not where you need to be. Or you're tempted to go back to who you used to be. Well, I stopped drinking, and my life hasn't gotten any better. I've stopped being this. My life hasn't gotten any better. So why not just continue to behave that way? For some of you, smoking is a huge deal. I started smoking and stopped smoking on the same day. I had a cousin who tried to teach me how to smoke, me and my older brother Tim. I thought I was going to die. I I mean, and my parents smoked for a good part of my life, and I was like, who? I thought I was going to pass out. I thought I literally was going to die, and I'm going, who who would do this? This is horrible. And I'd been around cigarettes my whole life. I, I, like many of us, you know, that just was your culture. And so I'm going, so that was one and only time I've ever had a cigarette, ever. And it was just one hit, and I was like, green, puking. Oh, it's horrible. So cigarettes have never been a struggle for me. Now, I'll smoke the daylights out of a good cigar. But you ain't going to inhale that thing. But I know guys who do. That is horrible. Now, for some people, you struggle with smoking off and on, off and off and off and on. And why do you go back to that? You quit for a while, then you go back. You quit for a while, then you go back. We're going to talk about that this morning. Not just smoking, but any behavior. He says, be careful when you think you're standing. That's when you're most likely to fall. When you think you've got this handled and you've overcome and now I can be around that and not struggle and that's when you're most likely to go back to what what you used to be. He says, no temptation has seized you. What a great visual. He says, seized you. No temptation has grabbed you. No temptation has, has sank its claws into you. No temptation has seized you except for what is common to everybody. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. We're going to stay right there for a second. Actually, let's, let's go back, Rick, if you don't mind, because there's something I want to point out. He says, if you think you, that you, has seized you, he will not let you 
So, but when you, so that you, so who do you think the point of temptation is about? You. Not me. You. It's about you, not the person sitting next to you, not somebody who you wish was here listening to this this morning. It's about you. That the devil is seeking to consume all of your life. Now, if you have Jesus as your Savior, he can never take that away from you. So when Jesus tells the story, he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you can have life, and you can have it to the fullest. That once you have Jesus as your Savior, you are forever secure in that salvation. But the devil seeks to tempt you and mess up your life. And many of you, we have lived that. We have made choices that didn't honor God, that were self-destructive, that hurt ourselves and hurt people that we love, and we've lost a lot because of those choices. And then he says, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He just talks all these verses about temptation and fleeing temptation and and a way out and all this, and he says, uh, flee from idolatry. Now, if you're not careful, you will miss the connection, and I want to help you understand the connection. All these areas that tempt you, all the stuff that you struggle with in your life to overcome, and they seem to always show up at the least um, favorable time, and you're tempted to to think a certain way or or commit a certain sin, you're you're tempted to stay where you are because that's the devil you know and you're comfortable in that, or you're tempted to go back to an old pattern of behavior. He says, flee from idolatry. Okay, so let's now, in your head, without answering out loud, because you don't want to embarrass you or somebody close to you, what is that thing that you're tempted to be or do or say? What is that thing? Okay, so let's throw something out. You are tempted, okay, so let's talk about pornography. It's rampant in our culture. It's everywhere. So let's say you're tempted to partake in that. You're tempted to look at it. You're tempted to engage in it. What is that doing for you? Is it helping you in your relationships? No. Is it helping you emotionally and spiritually? No. But it's, it's giving you a feeling that is false and temporary. So let's say, you, uh, let's say you're addicted to shopping. You know the feeling that you get when the Amazon truck pulls up outside of your house? Right? Are, for those of you who may or may not be retired, and you're consumed with three things, weather, traffic, and the mail. <laughs> if all you do all day is wonder if the mail has come, you need to be serving somewhere. You need to be investing your time in the community. If your daily conversations are, has the mail come? Has the mail, has the mail come? I think it's going to rain. I hope that doesn't stop the mail. So you... <laughs> so... But what you do is you spend money you don't have to buy stuff you don't need to impress people you don't even like. But that feeling of buy now and then two days later or three days later something shows up or you get a notice on your phone and you're not home and something has been delivered. Clutch the pearls. (laughs) Holy smoke. We got to hurry up and finish that hamburger. We got to get home. I, I may or may not have just bought a pair of golf shoes that, that may or may not have shown up two days early. I may or may not, when I backed in the driveway, didn't even pull into the garage, but got out and grabbed the box off my step, which I could have just as easily backed into the garage, went through the house, opened the front door, and grabbed the box. They may or may not be an identical pair of shoes that Caleb bones that I borrowed last week. Don't judge me. But isn't it funny how the stuff that tempts us, okay, so the thing that you thought of just a minute ago, that temptation that seems to be always there and it's subtle maybe, or, or maybe it's an attitude. You're tempted to think that, the world revolves around you. You're tempted to think that you get your value from something else. You're tempted to think whatever it is. How quickly does that temptation turn into the thing that you go to for validation? 
So we are, we are much more subtle than the Israelites. We're not melting down jewelry and building cows. We're not melting down stuff and building idols that sit in our dining room, in our office, or wherever. But these things that we're tempted to, to gravitate towards are giving us a feeling that at very best is a lie. And at very worst is destructive and consuming. And all these temptations are about idols. So when he says, flee from idolatry, we don't really understand or, or consider that. That temptation is about taking my attention away from God. We don't make that connection. And notice he says, flee from idolatry. He doesn't say, fight idolatry. He doesn't say, fight temptation. He says, run away from it. Run away. Get away from it. Get away from that behavior. Get away from that situation. Get away from that context. Run away. Most of us are very familiar with the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph had a bunch of brothers. He was one of his dad's favorite. And Joseph, for all intents and purposes, was a jerk. I know that's not popular to say, but Joseph's dad makes him a coat that none of the other brothers got. God gave Joseph visions and dreams that were about him being a leader and all of his older brothers bowing down to him. And Joseph goes and tells him that. If you, you have an older brother? How does that work out? Hey, I just want you to know that God told me someday you're going to bow down to me. How's that feel? Dude, you're going to get beat. You're going to get a beating. And so that's what he does. And, and his brothers finally fake his death, sell him into slavery. He ends up being, God has his hand on Joseph over and over again, and he ends up living in a house and being the manager of a house for this guy named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife was a horrible woman. She was a Jezebel spirit and toxic, and she tries to seduce Joseph. And this happens when it's just her and Joseph in the house, and Joseph runs. He doesn't sit down and say, hey, let's make some coffee and talk about you trying to seduce me. He doesn't do that. He runs away. And she, she, as he's leaving, she, grabs, she holds on to his clothes. She has evidence now of his behavior. He runs away. Don't be afraid to run away. Remove yourself from the context. That may mean in some of our lives that we remove, our, we remove people from our context. Like you don't need, you can be this close to me, but you can't be this close to me. We can be friends, we can be acquaintances, we can be all that, but we're not going to be buddies. I, I am blessed that most of my friendships are unbelievers. They don't yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I love that. I love those people in my life. Yesterday morning, I spent about four hours with one of these guys. He's a big one. He's 350 pounds, uh, six foot four, six foot five. When we ride in a golf, to get, golf cart together, we are at load capacity. <laughs> I'm on, on a hill. I mean, we're like, we're like the Flintstones. We're just kicking, <laughs> going up the hill. Um, he made a comment. So I, and I don't talk church to people. I don't talk Jesus to people um, unless they bring it up because I'm looked at as a paid salesman. That's it. You guys are satisfied customers. Do you get that? Okay, I'm a paid salesman. So I don't really bring it up unless they do, but that happens a lot as well. And so um, I, it just some circumstances worked out where I was in a cart with this guy. And, you know, we're 20 minutes in. He's like, hey, let me t can I ask you about sermons? Uh, okay. He goes, how, how often do you plan out sermons? And how long does it take you to, to write a sermon? And do you read them or do you just say them? And what do you, what do you talk about? And so we go through this whole conversation. I've known this guy for, for seven or eight years. So this whole conversation takes place. And, and he makes this statement randomly. He goes, you know, I could lose a whole day here. Now we're at a place where I play and he plays. We're, we're together quite a bit. And I said, you could lose a whole day here? He goes, oh, yeah. He said, I could come and sit in the clubhouse and drink all day. Never play golf. I could drink all day and just make fun of my friends when they came in. And he said, and by 10 or 11 o'clock at night, I've looked around and went, where'd the day go? 
Okay. So that's just my very, very good friend and bourbon. But what is that for you that you are tempted to use as an escape? To hide from your problems, to hide from looking yourself in the mirror, to hide from dealing with your stuff. And you're tempted to do that because being confronted with the changes that God is trying to make in your life are painful. And that hurts, and that requires change. So you are tempted to have that idol of escape and avoidance. So you are the target. All the temptation in your life. You, if this is about you. This is about Satan knowing your weaknesses. Hebrews chapter 4, 15. This is from the Living Bible. This high priest... So I, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews to Hebrew Christians. So when he says this high priest, he's talking about Jesus. And when you read the book of Hebrews, it's obviously written to Hebrew Christians. That's why it's called Hebrews. So there's this really interesting theme from front to back in the book of Hebrews that calls back like Jewish people's history. Like they knew who the high priest was and what his role was in their, in their faith system. And so when G, when when uh, Paul says, this high priest of ours, meaning Jesus, he understands our weaknesses. Since he had the same, te same temptations we do, though he never once gave way to them and sinned. So even Jesus walking the earth, and there's the very famous story, the narrative where Jesus had fasted for 40 days and, and he is tempted by Satan when he's at his weakest, and that's what you need to know. When you are less on top of your faith is when you are tempted. So it's important to stay close to God. It's, it's important to stay close to a faith community because sometimes you're tempted to go, I'm going to skip this morning. Have you ever come away better spiritually by skipping? Not once ever. Most of us suffer because of that. But we don't admit that because then we're admitting we shouldn't have skipped. And like we talked about last week, and you'll feel guilty. Well, feel guilty and repent, and you don't feel guilty anymore. Change your behavior. Have a plan with repentance. So he had, this, he had the same temptations we do, though he never once gave way to them. So he, he's, at his, he's very, very weak, and Satan shows up and says, hey, look, um, see all these kingdoms around you? I can give those to you. Hey, how, see that rock? I can turn that into food if you're really hungry, and I know you're really hungry. Um, you know, why don't you just throw yourself off of this, this tower? Because you, your father will send angels to protect you. Okay, here's what you need to know about that entire context and about you. You are always tempted with something you already have. Let me explain. Your temptations are there, and, they, and by giving into that, you get this brief feeling of value or worth or whatever it is. You already have that in Jesus Christ. So Satan is tempting you with something you already have. Does that make sense? If, if you were sitting, uh, we had some people over for dinner last night, and I made steak. And um, so we're sitting down and eating, and, and you know, they wanted their steaks a certain way, and I want mine. Like, my steak has a chance. You know what I mean by that? Like, it could get up and run all off. My steak has a chance. So if, 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 if you're sitting there eating dinner, and you're eating this steak, and somebody walks in and you says, hey, can I tempt you with steak? And you, you would think that's lunatic, wouldn't you? No, I'm, I'm eating steak right now. Why would, no. No. But that's what temptation is. You're being tempted with something you already have. You already have value in Jesus. You already have um, satisfaction in Jesus. You already have all those things in Jesus Christ. So then why, why would I give in to the temptation? The lie that that thing promises me, but I already have the truth in Jesus Christ. So here's what we understand. If our high priest, Jesus, was tempted, none of us are exempt. None of us will live a life without being tempted in some way or another. We'll be tempted to have an attitude. We'll be tempted to a specific sin. We'll be tempted to a specific behavior, to an attitude. You'll be tempted to be a victim your whole life. 
because you believe the lie that being a victim gets you pity. No, it just gets people annoyed. That's what it does, right? You've been a victim before. I've been a victim before. No one is exempt from temptation. We will all go through a temptation of some sort. So then what's the atmosphere? Where does that and how does that happen? What does that temptation look like in your life? So what's the atmosphere? And by atmosphere, I mean, what is that venue in which temptation takes place in your life? Now, as we've said recently, um, when you are in the wrong place, you're most likely to do the wrong thing, right? You are. So if you avoid those places and avoid those, whether those are physical places where you go or emotional places where you go or mental places where you go, avoid those, run away from those, and you'll most likely avoid giving in to those temptations. Now, so the atmosphere is, it could be a physical place, it could be a mental place, it could be an emotional place. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13a, meaning whenever you see A or B or C, it's like the first, second, or third part of that verse. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and yet God is faithful. So it, um, you're not unique. Everybody goes through problems. Everybody has a temptation that, they can struggle, that they'll struggle with, and that's one of the great things about programs like AA or Celebrate Recovery is that you identify now with a group of people that have a similar struggle. And so you have an opportunity to be transparent and say, man, this is my, I got, I'm, I'm struggling here. And, and if you struggle with, we'll use alcohol, if you're struggling with alcohol, don't hang out in bars. Isn't that shocking? I mean, really, that's, that seems very elementary, doesn't it? So if you're struggling in any area of your life, but you continue to operate in that atmosphere by choice, not because you have to, you're going to continue to be tempted. You're going to continue to struggle. He says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, we've probably all lived through certain things in our lives and said, you know, God, I don't, I don't think you really meant that because this feels like more than I can bear. I am in this situation that I don't want to be in, and this is a struggle, and this is difficult. And again, choose better choose better. There may be people in your life that are really close that don't need to be close anymore. And you will settle for relationships that are not helping you be more holy and more godly. So I mentioned my friend. My interactions with my friend are a very limited context. They just are. Like, I'm not going to sit in the clubhouse with him all day. One, I can't afford to lose a day. i got a lot of stuff happening. But even if I could, that is not making me more holy. That's not um, strengthening my walk with God or my walk with other believers. That's not a good testimony to him and his life. So those are temptations that if you choose to be around idiots, guess what? You're going to be an idiot. If you choose that pattern of behavior, you are going to be that. So there may be just relationships in our lives that we need to distance ourselves from because they are not helping us, and they just those are more opportunities for us to be tempted. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered. Now, I want you to pay close attention to everything that is said in these verses. Because when we go through hard times in our lives, we are tempted to behave in a very specific way. We are tempted maybe to, to, to become reclusive. Maybe we're tempted to become angry and bitter. We're tempted to think that somebody else's life is easier and my life is harder and God isn't fair. We are tempted to be resentful. We're tempted to all different kinds of behaviors. Listen to what Paul says. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Let that sink into you. We were under so much pressure, we couldn't endure it. So that we, was, that we despaired even of life. Now pay attention to that phrase. We despaired even of life. Verse 9. Indeed, in our hearts... 
we felt the sentence of death. We were suicidal. Did you ever consider that? The guy that we get most of our theology in the, in the New Testament, we, the, we know the most about Jesus Christ because of the same guy who wrote these words. He says, man, our lives seemed like it would be better off dead. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sense of death, but all of this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Three of the greatest words, three of the greatest letters to make up one word you'll ever find in Scripture is the word but. All this happened to us, but. We were taught that we were to rely on God and not ourselves. But on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will, del- and he will deliver us. So let's, let's talk about that reality in our lives. So when we are tempted in whatever area, maybe it's just tempted to throw up our hands and give up. God, this is just way too hard. God, this is costing me way too much. God, I don't know how, and I don't know what, and I don't know when, and so we're tempted all that. He says, he delivered us from such peril, and he will deliver us. Don't miss that, those two phrases. God has done this in your life already, and he will continue to do that. That you are here, in this world, still. And that's shocking, not just to you, but to everybody else. Do you, do you get that? That God has kept you around. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a place and thought if I and, and realized if I had been five minutes faster, I would have been in that wreck. If I had been five minutes later, this would have happened. God has delivered you, and He will continue to do that. On Him we have set our hope that He will continue to deliver us. So that that temptation, that that sin maybe that you're struggling with, and maybe it's a specific sin that you're like, man, I just cannot seem to overcome it. I can't seem to quit smoking. I can't seem to overcome this. I can't seem to overcome that. God says, I'll I'll deliver you. I'll deliver you. But you got to do your part. You got to step up. You have to be involved in this process. So how do we escape from temptation? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is the middle of that verse. He says, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now, if we're going to be really honest, which I encourage us all to do, do you really want out? Do you really want to stop that way of thinking? Do you really want to overcome that sin in your life? Do you really, really want that? That's such a hard reality to come to. Because if you say no, then we have to go down a whole other path. Okay, why not? What are you believing about that sin that is a total lie? What's that gaining you that you have told yourself this story? What is that? But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. But he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is also able to help those who are being tempted. Now notice what he says, because he himself, meaning Jesus, suffered when he was tempted. So how are you suffering when you're tempted? Really, think about that. He suffered when he was tempted. He didn't give in to the temptation, but the, but the fact that he was tempted caused suffering. So, when we are tempted in any way, any part of your life, that thing that you've thought of that you struggle with that you can't seem to overcome. How fun is that? It's agonizing, in it, isn't it? And, even, and when you give in to that temptation, it's even more so because guilt comes in and regret comes in and all these other emotions and feelings come in. Some of those are very legitimate from the Holy Spirit and some of, us are just, and some of those are just the story that you live in in your mind. So, Having made that statement, let me ask you this. How great is it when you just live in your own head? Exactly. 
It is a nightmare, right? Because most of the things you tell yourself in your mind are not true, are not true. So when Paul says you need to take your thoughts captive, tell yourself the right things. Stop living in your head. Stop being a slave to all those thoughts and feelings that may or may not be legitimate. And well, she must not like me because, oh, that's exhausting, isn't it? I think they're talking about me. Oh, good Lord. Uh, Hopefully they are. And hopefully you give them something to talk about. Good stuff to talk about. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He's able to help those who are being tempted. So here's, this is the best, I think, thing that we can do with temptation. When when we have those things that were tempting us, you, you take the way out. You just take it. You have to want to not be a slave to that behavior anymore, a slave to those thoughts, a slave to that sin. But when you have that opportunity, which the Bible says, he'll provide a way out for you, then take it. Take the way out. Walk out the door. Distance yourself in a relationship. Um, put controls on your computer. That And there's a bunch of services out there that help people not be slaves to pornography. Throw all your alcohol away. Throw your alcohol away. If that's your struggle, get rid of it. You just can't have it in your house if that's your struggle. There's always a way out. Always. There is always a way out. It may be a big door. It may be a small window. But there is always a way out. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that we not only have Jesus our example for, for dealing with temptation in our lives, but we also have the Apostle Paul. Father, I, I ask this morning that, that you give us hearts that no longer want to be a slave to the things that tempt us. Father, I, help, I ask that you would help us identify those, I, those idols in our lives where we are tempted to turn to all kinds of other things instead of you to give us value, to give us validation. Father, help us to kill those giants in our lives. Father, thank you so much that you love us and you want more for us than we could possibly imagine. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins that gives us the opportunity to have hope. We love you and we thank you. And in Jesus' name we all said, Amen. Amen.